Hey, welcome everyone to 40 Agile Method of Methods in 40 Minutes 2022 edition by Craig Smith. We are glad that Craig can join us today. Thank you, BJ. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Craig Smith. Uh, I am the Global Agility Lead at SoftEd. I'm coming to you from Australia. Uh, also the uh, host of the Agile Revolution podcast and a uh, director of the Agile Alliance as well. Uh, thank you for uh, joining me. We're going to talk 40 Agile Methods in 40 Minutes, the 2022 edition. Uh, I did this talk um, about uh, back in about 2015, I think it was, so about seven years ago. And there was a reason I did it. Uh, I was doing a talk to the Scrum Gathering, and I really just wanted to tell Scrum folks that there were 39 other methods out there. Uh, but what it actually turned into was uh, both a discovery for myself, but also a discovery for people uh, who saw this, because we sometimes just can't be across all of the things that are happening in the Agile community. So this is what I'm really going to be sharing with you in this talk is um, a bunch of Agile methods. Now, these slides are going to go pretty quickly. Don't uh, worry too much if you can't uh, get the details or try to snapshot it. We'll make all the slides and information available to you. They're very feature rich. You'll have all the links and things that you that you need. So uh, I just suggest you sit back and enjoy the ride and let's see if we can get through this in, in 40 minutes. Hey? So as I said, coming to you from, uh, from Australia and uh, yeah, really uh, we have to look outside of the uh, methods that we, we currently use. So if everybody's ready, uh, you got yourself a beverage and some popcorn, uh, this is gonna go fast, so let's go. So I wanted to start with the foundational methods. And in fact, uh, it doesn't even get a number because it is the basis of everything we do. And it's the manifesto for agile software development. We often call it the agile manifesto, obviously. Uh, 17 uh, folks who were just trying to build agile methods back in the 1990s got together for a conference uh, uh, on a mountaintop in Utah and uh, they came up with four values and 12 principles and of course I'm sure you all know the four values we value the things on the left a little more than the things on the right and this has been the basis for every method that we will see uh, in this talk today uh, but also I guess for all agilists it's the basis to where we go to now we could debate whether it needs to be updated there's you know, some wording in there that uh, probably needs to uh, change I mean the word software is always the one that comes up that maybe we should turn it to uh, solutions uh, but this is at its core and I think the thing that if you think about this as having it been around for 20, you know, 20 plus years now is that it served us well and the way that they wrote it still holds pretty much true today. So that's the basis for everything we work on. So let's look at uh, method number one. Uh, I'm sure you're mostly familiar with this, it's Scrum. Uh, in the latest uh, surveys that they've done, uh, this is still the most popular method. It's uh, bounced between 60 and 70% for 10 plus years now it's the most popular method goes all the way back to 1996 it actually goes back even earlier than that you can trace its origins back to the late 80s um, in particular uh the uh harvard business review article called the new new product development game uh where they were just looking at the fact that product development is very much like a game of rugby which is where the name scrum came from now so much stuff out there. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Scrum uh, and if not the iterative method that's based around it. A lot of other methods use it at its core. Uh, lots of different certifications. It's branched in the last few years. Um, the Scrum Guide is the thing that holds it together, uh, recently updated in 2020. Um, the other thing of Scrum is it's really based on small teams. And uh, that's the challenge as we start to scale, but a lot of the scaling methods use it at its core. Uh, and there are numerous sources for this. Um, the other th debate is, I guess, that there's no technical practices in there either. But uh, yeah, they recently updated with values, so, which you can see up in the top right-hand corner. Um, and it is the basis for most of the iterative processes that are in use today. The problem with Scrum is that it sometimes turns into what we call Scrum but. And that's when, if you've ever heard yourself saying, in my organization, we're doing Scrum, but our sprints are 12 weeks long, or we're doing Scrum, but uh, you know, we don't have a full-time product owner. And that's really the issue with Scrum. If you're following Scrum, it's the rules of the game. Uh, so uh, what Ken Schwaber uh, said is we actually need to turn that around um, and not be talking about Scrum, but, but talking about we do Scrum and. And that's when you start to run out of runway and need to uh, have more methods in your toolbox. And that's a lot of what we're talking about today is even if you're using Scrum, you're going to be looking for other things. So think about moving towards Scrum and. Uh, extreme programming, XP. 
not this XP, but uh, you know, the Extreme Program XP, also came out about the same time as Scrum 1996, uh, Kent Beck, uh, popularised by uh, the White Book, as it seems there. There was a second edition. I was never a fan of the second edition. This was my Bible when I started my Agile journey back in the early 2000s. And I think a lot of people forget, if you look at the process up the top, that it looks a lot like Scrum. It had a very similar process. Instead of sprints, it talked about iterations. Uh, it talked about release planning. Um, it uh, popularised user stories, which uh, weren't really talked about in the Scrum guide. So if you're using some of those terms, it's probably because you borrowed it from a hybrid of extreme programming. And that's actually where the popularity of Scrum came about is whilst it was very good at talking about the process, uh, people use the technical practices, particularly in building software from XP. Um, as you can see there, though, that you can't pick and choose them on the right hand side. Uh, the practices, there are lots of them, and uh, they all sort of work a little bit hand in hand. It also had a set of values. Um, these practices have just become good software engineering practice, to be honest with you, but uh, it's still surprising the number of teams that probably haven't licked these. Uh, so still worth a look. Uh, the book is still awesome if you haven't read it. Crystal. Um, Crystal is the work by Alistair Coburn, goes back to the 19, early 1990s. It was popularized by his book, Crystal Clear. Uh, interestingly, however, this was supposed to be a set of books. Uh, if you see at the top there, there was supposed to be a whole pile of colors for it. Uh, crystal yellow, orange, red, magenta, and blue. And the idea was that depending on the size of your team, which is the uh, axis moving uh, across the horizontal, um, and the type of work you were doing, whether it was comfortable, discretionary, essential, or life-threatening, uh, would depend the type of uh, crystal that you used uh, and how you used it. Uh, it was it, it was certainly uh, used or at least uh, referenced a lot back in the day. Uh, probably not one you see around now too much, but where you might get some value out of this is there are a lot of things that I suspect that we talk about and we use in the Agile community today that uh, show their roots to Alistair and, and Crystal Clear. You know, if you talk about frequent delivery, if you talk about uh, having a good technical environment, if you talk about cross-functional teams, they're the languages that came from Crystal Clear. It's, uh, it's well, worth a, well worth a look if you haven't seen it. One of the popular methods, uh, and this was particularly throughout uh, Europe in the 1990s, was DSDM. Uh, DSDM, again, 1994. So these were all about the same, same vintage. Um, and again, all of these folks were uh, uh, part of the Agile Manifesto. Um, again, whether you've seen this or not, the, the thing about DSDM was it was a lot more structured. Um, it aligned a lot more to uh, some of the project management techniques of the time. You can kind of see that in some of the diagrams here. Had a very clear process. Uh, again, there are things from here that you may not realize that you've been using over the years. Uh, if you're familiar with the Moscow technique, must have, should have, could have, won't have yet, that was uh, described inside DSDM. In more recent years, in 2016, they evolved this to something called Agile PM, but it still has the same roots in there. Um, one of the problems in the early days was that uh, you did have to, uh, I guess, uh, pay to, to join it. It's all pretty freely available these days. Um, DSDM, I say it's relatively uncommon. It's actually one of those things that keeps popping along. Uh, so you will see it pop up, uh, but well worth a look, uh, even if you're using other methods, uh, because there is a lot of uh, good stuff in there. Evo is probably the oldest um, technique. Uh, it goes back to Tom Gill back in 1960. And if any of you were at the, uh, the Agile India Light conference, you might have heard, seen uh, Tom, Tom speak. Um, and uh, yeah, this was the original Agile method. Uh, we could consider this the start of Agile. Uh, he talked about the, the Plan, Do, Study, Act. He had a lot of principles in here. And again, things that uh, we consider to be good Agile practice today, breaking things down, doing the high risk things early, uh, you know, open-ended architecture. Now remember, this was in the 1960s, 1960s through the 1980s particularly. Um, the thing about this is that the book is good. Some of the resources um, are a little vague to get um, and a lot of newer methods are built on these principles. But if you wanna go and take a look back at how this all started, uh, go take a look at Evo. Another one of the foundational methods is RAD, Rapid Application Development, uh, also Adaptive Software Development. Uh, this one goes back to the uh, early 90s, uh, James Martin and his RAD approach. Uh, you know, He was just trying to look for things at high quality, high speed and low cost. Um, but meeting the needs of users, which was uh, a little radical at the time. Uh, so uh, as, as to the name Rad, uh, Jim Highsmith picked this up in his work on adaptive software development. And one of the things that really came out of, uh, out of his work was uh, this idea of the loop. And if you've, uh, if you've got different stages in your uh, development process, um, in his book, he talked about um, speculation, collaboration, and learning. But if you have uh, cycles that you go through, uh, some sort of discovery, then delivery, 
it goes back to the roots of Jim and adaptive software development. Uh, most of this is reasonably uncommon these days. Um, you know, it was the concept of good enough work um, and often against, I guess back in the 1990s was a bit before its time, it was considered hack and test because you didn't have the ability to get things out to users quickly. But uh, you know, a lot of, again, a lot of our methods are built on the, uh, the shoulders of these giants. So there, there was a lot of early methods, they're just some of them. Let's go and take a look now though at lean methods. And of course, the granddaddy is all of the leans, whether we call it lean, lean manufacturing, lean enterprise, or the Toyota production system. We can trace our roots to that all the way back to the 1850s and Eli Whitney um, as part of the Industrial Revolution. Um, it started to get its roots though with Toyota and Taiko Ono in 1936, when they really started talking about the Toyota production system and the House of Lean. And it was James Womack in 1990 who wrote a book called The Machine That Changed the World that made this visible to everybody. So again, what you're starting to see is the 1990s were where things were starting to move along. Now, of course, when we talk about lean, lean is about the key lean principles uh, that you can see up there, the five of them. Um, and also the fact that we put our focus on Kaizen and improvement uh, and Carters in having repeatable processes and also removing the mood or the wastes. If you look through lean, there are so many learnings here, right? Even though it's based around manufacturing, um, we can learn things in IT and business in general, but you have to get past the manufacturing wording. Um, and uh, one of the things you have to be very, open to is gathering of metrics. Uh, but uh, despite uh, Toyota having launched this, pretty much every key manufacturer uses some element of lean and it's uh, very prominent in uh, non-IT parts of the business as well. So we've got some subparts to this, the theory of constraints. Uh, this builds upon lead and uh, this is from the work of Eli Goldrack in 1984, his awesome book called The Goal. If you haven't read it, uh, it is a, a luminary text. Um, if you've ever talked about bottlenecks, you know, we see them in manufacturing, we see them in all sorts of uh, process work, is that you, know, you can only be as fast as your slowest part of the process. And so being able to find those bottlenecks um, and increase the throughput uh, is what that's all about. It seems pretty self-explanatory, but being able to identify that constraint and then restructure around it is the, is the key to this. And again, lots of methods and models just have this as part of it. It's well regarded. The interesting thing about the goal is there's lots of things in there that I still don't think we've you know, truly uncovered. So again, it is, a, it is worth a look. The problem with lean, as we said, though, it doesn't have a technical language. And so uh, the Poppendeeks, Mary and Tom Poppendeek in 2003, decided to make them something that was more relatable to technology. Uh, and they did this in their book, Lean Software Development. So seven principles and 22 tools of taking lean and applying it to software development and, uh, and a technical process. And you can see there, they've got a, a bunch of principles where they've taken the same things and, and turned them around. And in fact, they wrote a number of books past this. So all of their books are well worth a look at. If you get the opportunity to, to see or, or hear Mary and Tom Poppendick speak, um, you know, they make a lot of this uh, very real. Of course, this is something that we're still trying to discover. And uh, there's been lots of attempts at uh, trying to make this more, uh, more available to people. Uh, one of the more modern ones is the flow system. Uh, it just came out a few years ago. Uh, Nigel Thurlow, John Turner and Brian Rivera, they're ex uh, Toyota folks um, who again, were trying to uh, make this more to the type of world that we live in right now, particularly our, our VUCA type world. Um, so again, they have the, the house um, as Lean does, but really a focus on what they call the triple helix of flow, which is complexity thinking, distributed leadership and team science. Um, some of their principles, I mean, putting the customer first, um, that, uh, that flow of value. You can get the flow guide uh, for free. There is a book that follows this. Um, what is interesting though, is to really get into it. It can get actually quite comprehensive. They have a comprehensive certification assessment process uh, behind it, um, but you can get started. Uh, in, in order to learn a little more about this and their, and their thinking behind it. If we start thinking about lean, um, you know, the, the thing was that it was in manufacturing, but we were starting to think about uh, what does this mean? And all the way back to the 1930s, we can go back to Edwards Deming. Now, I suspect if it hasn't happened already, you will have some speaker today at the conference uh, or over the next few days at the conference, uh, will quote Edwards Deming. Uh, you know, he was a pioneer of his time. And uh, as I said, we're talking about 80 plus years ago now. Uh, he came up with his 14 points for management. Now, if you look at the points there on the, on the page, um, we could argue that the language is a little dated, but the interesting thing is, is that this was agility back in the forties. You know, even though he talked about things like eliminate inspection, building quality, 
Uh, what that was really saying is inspect and adapt, right? Quality is important. You know, break down barriers, work as a team. We now call that things like cross-functional teams or multidisciplinary teams. You know, eliminate quotas and substitute leadership. In other words, self-organization. So the words have changed a little bit, but the principles have been around for a long time. This is nothing new. Um, and we are still uncovering uh, a lot of the things that, uh, that he came up with. The other interesting thing about Deming was he has the Plan Do Study Act loop there. You may know that as Plan Do Check Act. He said that uh, he wanted to use the word study because it emphasizes inspection over analysis. So he was really thinking about inspect and adapt when he did this. A lot of deep stuff. The nice thing about his books is because they're so old now, they're actually all uh, uh, freely openly available. Uh, so you can download them um, as a part of a Creative Commons or they're, they're out of copyright. Uh, so go take a look at Deming if you haven't, uh, haven't read that or, or discovered it. In more modern times though, we have Don Reineston uh, and his uh, Principles of Product Development Flow. Uh, 175 principles, right? There's a lot of stuff in here. Um, we're going to be unpacking this stuff for years. Um, but essentially what uh, Don does in his book is he proves why Agile and Lean works. Uh, he looks at things like, you know, why we should break things down, why we should do uh, things like cost of delay, why work in progress limits are important, uh, controlling our batch size. Uh, so all the things that we build into agility, a lot of them come back to this. So if you're ever looking for that evidence uh, or the mathematics in some cases, go take a look at Don's, Don's book, uh, all 135 principles of it. Now, ironically, the book has a waterfall on the cover. Uh, also, uh, the book I'm going to tell you now is a little hard to read. Um, I had the great pleasure to meet Don a few years ago. I asked him the question, why, uh, you know, what is it about his book that makes it hard to read? And he said to me, Craig, my book is like fine cheese. Uh, you can only take it in small doses. Uh, but a great book, one you want to have in your bookshelf if you're interested in that. Also at its lean roots is Kanban. I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, with Kanban. Um, the thing about Kanban is, is that a lot of people only ever stop at the first core property, which is visualizing the workflow. We talk about a Kanban board or a Kanban wall, uh, but that's only one of the five properties. If to be truly doing the Kanban approach, you also need to limit your work in progress. You need to measure and manage your flow. So looking at things like cycle time, you need to make your process policies explicit. In other words, uh, what is the rule from something moving from one column to another? And uh, also use models to recognize improvement opportunities. It's based on four principles. Start where you are, uh, look for evolutionary change, respect the process, uh, and uh, everybody is a leader. The thing about Kanban is that uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a rival in a lot of cases to Scrum because sometimes that whole idea of sprints just don't make any sense. But if you're gonna move to Kanban, it does require a lot of discipline. If you can do something in Scrum, you can absolutely do it in Kanban, but you'll need a different set of disciplines to do, to do that. At the same time, uh, as uh, David J. Anderson was working on Kanban, uh, Jim Benson and uh, Tony Ann was working on personal Kanban. They were sort of working in the same, same space. This is essentially Kanban for your own to-do list, right? personal Kanban. And it actually just has two rules. Same as the uh, uh, same as Kanban, but it's just visualize your work and limit your work in progress. And that's important for your task list because we all know we can't multitask. So it's, it, they've got steps here. It's, uh, um, it, it's not about scaling. It's about your own personal thing, uh, personal focus, but uh, well worth a look, particularly for managing your own things and being able to practice agility in your own space. Lean startup, right? We've gone through this revolution, I guess, where um, uh, you know, startups, uh, particularly in the uh, late 2000s, and so, you know, this was interesting that when this book was published in 2008 by Eric Rees, it was a New York Times number two bestseller. Uh, no book in Agile or project management had ever done that before. And it was because, you know, it laid out how to be an entrepreneur. But what's important is that uh, even for organizations, entrepreneurship is super important. And it was just based on this very clear loop of build, measure and learn and do it quickly. Um, one of the interesting things about the book was that um, it assumed Agile at the core. So even in 2008, it said, of course, you're going to be doing all of the, the basic Agile practices. Um, in some cases, people kind of say this has got a little bit of hype on it. And a lot in more recent times, you know, people criticize it because it focuses more on features rather than full products. Um, again, that uh, there's an element of truth to that. But being able to go quickly and uh, just do small things, build the measurement, learn them has a lot of value. Let's take a look at some of the extending methods now, um, because some, sometimes we, uh, we have things and we kind of want to pull them together or, or pull them apart. 
And here's a pile of extending methods that uh, you may or may not have come across. Uh, modern Agile from Joshua Kurievsky, Heart of Agile uh, from Alistair Coburn, Agnostic Agile from Sam Zawadi are all extending methods. They all take um, agility and put a modern interpretation on it. Modern Agile is just uh, down, down to simple four principles. Heart of Agile, the same. Agnostic Agile, a few more principles there, but really saying, hey, let's, uh, let's be agnostic. And, uh, and even uh, at SoftEd, we've been working on our own uh, sort of a thing here called the value life cycle, as you can, say, you can see here. That, you know, essentially, um, all products need to you know, continue spinning through the discovery, delivery, and operate loops. There's also been a lot of hybrid type approaches. Right, people putting things together. So you put Scrum and Kanban together, you get Scrum Ban. Uh, if you put XP and uh, Kanban together, you get Zanban. If you uh, put Scrum and XP together, you get Scrum XP. That's from the folks at Safe. Uh, so all of these things are putting these together and they can work together effectively. Uh, the things to look out for though, right? Just because you're doing Agile doesn't mean that. And often organizations fall into what we call water scrum fall. This was a term coined by Dave West from Forrester back in 2011, uh, that essentially, just because you're doing Scrum, have you look left and right? right? How fast does it take your, your requirements to get through? How fast can you get it to the hands of users? Lots of all large organizations still fall into water scrum fall. More recently in 2016, Uter Eckstein and John Buck, Uter is talking at the conference uh, uh, today as well. So look out for her. Um, a few years ago, they came up with the Bossa Nova, which is putting together beyond budgeting, sociocracy and open space uh, for a new way of looking at agility, all hybrid methods. Sometimes we want to know how these things work. And so uh, we have something called Scrum Plop, which maybe, you've, uh, uh, maybe you, you haven't come across. If you've ever sort of wondered the patterns, because software development is all about patterns. Well, people have done some work to actually get the plat patterns out of Scrum. And that's this uh, program called Scrum Plop. From 2010, 2010 Jeff Sutherland and Jim Copline, uh, they wrote a book about it a few years ago. Um, and uh, you can go to the website, uh, scrumplop.org, and you can see all the patterns. Now, since the pandemic, it's it sort of uh, seems to have dropped off a little bit. Um, they used to have an annual conference, and of course, that couldn't happen for the last couple of years. Um, but still, you know, a lot of these things haven't changed too much over the years. Uh, you'll see lots of really good patterns in there. A few folks have said, look, we need to do something different with Agile. And so we ended up with Agile 2. I'm not sure if we needed it or not, but Agile 2 came out in 2020, 43 principles uh, around agility because yeah, look, you know, we need to take a fresh look. Look, I got to say this, that uh, I think if these guys were smart, they would have came up with 42 principles, which would have been the meaning of life. They missed a, a, a geek calling there. Uh, nonetheless, well worth a look. There's some interesting things in there around their values and principles um, and, uh, and a look at it. The problem is, is that in its own right, there's not a lot of guidance here uh, and it's just a bunch of ideas, um, but still some interesting things. And I suspect that this may start to evolve over time. We've also taken a lot of our things that we've learnt uh, in agility to manufacturing. Um, and this was built on some work by Joe Justice, uh, uh, originally when he was at Wikispeed and more recently around agile hardware in his work at Tesla. Um, now, Wikispeed, if people don't know, is about building a, um, a, building a car for the uh, X Prize, um, and they essentially used agile practices to do it, right? Had Scrum Masters, did it iterations, um, and a lot of organizations got very interested in what uh, they were doing. In more recent times, Joe uh, has been working at Tesla um, and uh, talks about how they apply these practices to manufacturing. Um, so it's essentially agile outside of IT. Um, he talks about the fact that you know, there's 27 changes a week as part of innovation and everybody gets their hands dirty on the production line, even Elon Musk. Um, if you're looking for details about this, it's not terribly well documented. There's a lot of videos and they're well worth a look. Um, uh, the other thing is, is that you know, I guess uh, the culture of Tesla is built around this. You know, the thing about factories is it's hard to change um, those things for experiments so very fast. And the other thing that's with this is that some suppliers really struggle with the with the speed of change but again it's an interesting experiment uh in uh, in where manufacturing might be going all right let's change pace and let's talk with, uh, about scaling methods uh because you know, we talked about Scrum um, being at the team level, but now what we're trying to do is scale agility across the enterprise. Uh, 
And many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with SAFE, the Scaled Agile Framework. Um, it is the most popular scaling method by far at 37% of uptake, uptake, based around the big picture, which is the thing on the left-hand side there. Um, been around since the uh, mid-2000s uh, from Dean Leffingwell. In fact, earlier than that, if you go back and read his, uh, read his books, the interesting thing is if you read the book Scaling Software Agility, it's about requirements. If you read the book Agile Software Requirements, it's about scaling. Um, but uh, particularly Agile Software Requirements was the book where that was starting to start to form this idea of, uh, of SAFE. Uh, look, it's a, a very popular in large organizations and government. Um, there is a lot of community criticism on the framework. Um, you know, uh, people either love it or hate it. Uh, you know, and uh, it also has a lot of influence from RUP, which is where Dean Leffingwell came from, and also a lot of certifications built around it. But if you do get into, into it, right, it is based upon agility, right? You can see the core values and the principles. Um, they're all built on sound things. Um, I think sometimes it just comes down to, you know, whether you can map your organization into this box or not, again, which is why you need these other methods. All right, but it is worth a look, uh, but is it the end game, which a lot of people think it is? You just can't implement safe and be agile, um, but uh, it might be the right starting point for you. This isn't the only scaling method though. We have disciplined agile, DAD, as well as DA Flex. Uh, been around for since 2012, uh, in more recent years being picked up by the PMI uh, and integrated into their work. Um, again, a toolkit, a lot of the same things that there are in SAFE. Um, it has, it has, from the early days, had a lot of coverage of things like governance and DevOps uh, and architecture and very enterprise IT aware, probably more so in some respects than SAFE is. Um, but uh, again, when you read it, uh, can be considered a bit heavyweight. Uh, it has a lower market ad adoption um, and uh, the PMI is still uh, integrating it to, um, to date. So it's gonna be interesting to see where this goes into the future. Uh, DA Flex is a, a subset of that, which was the work by Al Shalloway, uh, which is the, uh, the life cycle part of the, of the process or the base stream part of the process. Another scaling alternative is less large scale Scrum. Um, again, this was built on um, work from the 2000s by Craig Larman and Bas Vod. Uh, back in the early days, uh, you know, when um, you know, a bunch of us was just trying to figure this out, the only thing we had to look for scaling, there were no frameworks, there were just these two books uh, by Craig and Bass, Scaling Lean Agile Development, the first and second book. And that's about all we had. And it wasn't until 2015 when they really started to document out uh, large scale Scrum. Now, this is about taking Scrum and scaling it. Uh, it is uh, up until recently been very much around case studies as opposed to direct instruction. And this is one of the reasons why people struggle with it. In more recent time, they have added principles uh, to the process. Uh, so they have built the book. Uh, they have less for up to eight teams and uh, the what I think is a silly name, less huge uh, for up to a few thousand people. Uh, still a smallish adoption, but it is growing. Um, sometimes it's a little difficult for people to implement. Spotify, not a model, but people do it anyway. Henrik Nyberg popularized this back in 2012, which was just the work that Spotify were doing at the time. Initially, if you look at Spotify in 2022, they're not doing a lot of this, right? The, the roots are there. Uh, so it was never an approach, but we have to put it here because lots of uh, you know, people talk about it. It is well worth a look though. If you haven't seen the engineering culture videos, there's a couple of those which you can go see. Um, you know, even 10 years on, there are things that I find in lots of organizations that were just not at. It had its own set of principles, um, but the idea of this was, was something that worked well for Spotify at the time. So if your organization happens to be a music streaming company in Northern Europe, uh, maybe this is something you want to approach. Um, they did popularize this whole idea of words like squads and tribes and chapters and guilds. If you're using those, it's again, it's probably because somebody has watched the video or read the, uh, read the PDF. It is not a framework, it's just a sharing of experiences. But again, there are things that we can learn from here. Scrum at scale is probably one of the newer scaling methods, uh, came out in uh, 2014, um, and it's been evolving over time. Uh, this one is only meant for, for small teams, um, and, uh, but it does allow you to scale. Uh, again, there's lots of language in this, um, this idea of minimal viable bureaucracy, uh, uh, this idea of an executive action team or an EAT, and an executive Metascrum team or an EMT. Um, but the idea is getting people to the Scrum masters together as well, the product owners together and scaling those types of things. It clearly builds on Scrum. It's built on the work of uh, Jeff Sutherland. You can download the Scrum at Scale guide freely in order to look at it. The key thing about this one that people struggle with is it requires a whole pile of organizational redesign in order to do it. And is your organization really up for that? Uh, but as I said, gaining interest, um, uh, very interesting. 
The other one that's been around for a while is Nexus Framework. So you know, Jeff was on Scrum at Scale, Ken Schwaber was um, this one, about the same time. Um, look, if you read the diagram at the top, it looks exactly like the Scrum process and all they've done is shove the word Nexus in front of everything. So instead of a sprint backlog, you have a Nexus sprint backlog, you have a Nexus integration team, you have a Nexus daily Scrum and you have a Nexus sprint review. Um, but seriously, um, you know, the idea of this is you scale it um, and all, and essentially this team of team type idea that your team and all the other teams, they get together and it's a combined, uh, uh, combined process. Um, not a lot of usage that I've seen in my in my travels um, and uh, just assume scrums, but if you're looking for somewhere to start, it might be a uh, one to take a look at. One of the newer uh, scaling frameworks is FAST. FAST Agile stands for Fluid Scaling Technology. Um, and the idea behind this um, is that it combines particularly open space and open allocation. Um, you know, if you look at something like, uh, like uh, Scrum and Kanban, they fit very well in that complex or complicated part of Kinefin. FAST is really supposed to be in that, uh, in that complex and also uh, when you're bringing things back from chaotic. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, essentially a more modern version of, uh, uh, of an agile framework. Again, it has a set of principles and, and values as well. Um, it relies on dynamic reteaming and that uh, you know, teams will continue to form around work whenever they need to. Um, there's only one meeting. So uh, you know, none of this uh, you know, four events or whatever it is you have in Scrum, just one meeting, it's called the fast meeting. Um, and it's built around a lot of modern approaches, things like open space and open allocation and, and uh, lean startup. It's only a new model. I haven't seen a lot of usefulness, uh, your sort of use of this at the moment. It does require a lot of uh, discipline and uh, you do need to read it very carefully. There's not just a big picture you can kind of follow. Uh, it's more based around principles, but again, it's something worth taking a look at. All right. Let's take a look at some technical methods. We're past halfway, folks. We're doing well. Um, so the technical methods, right? DevOps, DevSecOps, and GitOps. Here they all are. Date back to 2009 and Patrick Dubois, probably best diagram uh, described in the DevOps handbook. Uh, you know, DevOps is our bringing of Dev and Ops together. DevSecOps obviously brings the security side into it. We also have GitOps, which is uh, uh, also bringing in the, uh, the whole idea of um, how we actually do operational type work. Um, Again, if you look back to the water scrum fall we talked about before, this is about fixing that problem um, of the, the scrum fall type part. The key one about this is that this is not a team, it is a culture um, and it's not a tool, right? It is a culture. Yes, there are teams and tools that may help you in doing this, but it has to be part of the culture of what we all do. Programmer Anarchy is an interesting one. Um, it's been renamed to Chaos Development more recent times. This was the work of Fred George. It was actually based off some work he did at a company in the UK called Forward, but it has been adopted in organizations such, a, such as GitHub over the years. And what you'll see is, is that essentially what they did is they um, moved from agile to very fuzzy practices. Um, you know, they said, look, we don't need stand-ups. We don't need retrospectives. We don't even need managers. Uh, we can get rid of all those, all those things and just work fast. You see, this is developer-driven development. And if you have a very good culture, you could possibly do this. So in some organizations where they uh, can work in this lightweight culture and everybody is committed to the cause, uh, this could work really well. Uh, if you wanna look at this, uh, there's a couple of PDFs and conference talks around. Um, you know, it does require that highly skilled uh, team in order to do it. Um, beware, there's no testing or planning in here, right? Because you're going at speed. So it's a hard one if you wanna convince your managers to do it, but you can learn some things from it. It's very interesting. Uh, so go take a look at the work of Fred George. The Mercado method is another method that uh, developers use. If you've ever done refactoring, you may not have realized that there is a method behind it. Um, so you know, sometimes I talk to developers and they say they're doing some refactoring. Um, and I say, well, actually, does it follow this? So again, if you, if you want to put some uh, method around some of the things you're doing, take a look at the Mercado method for refactoring. You've heard of pair programming, but mob programming has been uh, building in popularity since 2012 when it was introduced by Woody Zool. Um, instead of two people sitting at one computer, it's a whole team sitting at a computer. What's been interesting over the last few years is actually just seeing the amount of organizations that actually try to do this and, uh, and it's continuing to grow. Uh, it's an interesting thing. It's well worth looking at the process and watching the videos. Um, when I first saw Z uh, Woody talk about this back in the early days, he, said he, uh, he basically convinced you after 40 minutes this was a good thing and then told you not to do it because the whole reason this came about was his team were just looking for a better way of working. But lots of organizations and, and teams have, have looked at this and have started to adopt it. And there's a lot more stuff behind this now than there was in the early days. So uh, worth a look. 
And of course, we've uh, re looked at testing and those type of things. So we have TDD, ATD, BDD, and SBE, um, all the way back to Kent Beck in 1994 with test-driven development, you know, just doing small things, uh, you, know, uh, you know, build a failing test, pass that test, and then refactor with confidence. You know, we then scaled that out to the wider part, which is um, ATDD, which is let's do it for a story card or for a piece of work, right? Have a failing test, do the story, prove that you pass the test. Um, and then that's evolved into a whole process, which is um, uh, BDD and SBE, specification by example, and uh, behavior-driven development, which allows us also to put some more rigor around the entire process. Um, both these books are really good if you're looking for the developer side, Kent Beck's book, um, or specification by example by Goico, uh, both awesome books. Um, and again, uh, just part of process when you're really starting to uh, go at speed and scale in an agile method. What people don't realize though, is that the testing community for many years has been trying to move in an agile way. Um, and so context-driven testing has been around since the early 2000s. Um, again, they had a whole pile of principles. And if you read through those, they are about agility. Um, so it's aligned to agile testing. And uh, really the idea was is to bring humans to the forefront. Not really a technique, but it's a school of thought. Um, it is worth going take a look at. Um, again, sometimes we ignore testing. It's sometimes one of the biggest roadblocks we have to agility. In more recent years, business agility has become the thing. Um, and so in the business agility domain, we have a whole pile of uh, different things here. Uh, Evan was talking just before me. Uh, he has the domains, the domains of business agility from the Business Agility Institute. Uh, similarly, the, um, the uh, Agile Business um, uh, Organization has their own ones and their framework for business agility. And uh, Nick Kirsten is also well known for his flow framework, which came out in 2018 um, about trying to move flow. All of these things are about looking and saying, hey, we don't have true agility until it matches across the entire organization which means we have to look at other things, for example, beyond budgeting. You know, finance is often uh, where there is a bottleneck. So again, this has been around since the 1990s, started with the uh, uh, first book by Jeremy Hope and Robin Fraser uh, and Peter Bunce, uh, and more recently, the work of Bjarne Bognes. Um, really around the oil industry is where this has started and is very popular in Europe, uh, but uh, is uh, something that more organizations are starting to think about uh, as they start to move forward. The interesting thing is it's based on uh, these 12 principles here. Only one of them has anything to do with money. Right? All the others are around management and leadership processes, right? Typically we put budgeting in place because of you know, trust issues. So it's about saying, hey, how can we reduce some of that complexity um, and uh, move budgeting forward? Design thinking is another one um, uh, of the processes. There's a whole pile in here. The um, you know, human-centered design goes all the way back to the 1950s, but popularized really in 2005 by David Kelly and Tim Brown when they spun uh, IDEO out of the Stanford Design School. You know, and the interesting thing is if you go back to the manifesto, uh, you know, the first principle in the manifesto um, says that, uh, you know, that uh, we need to primarily satisfy the customer. Well, that's why human-centered design works so well with this. And really, this is about fixing our discovery process. So again, talking about that order scrum fall, how do we actually make things happen faster, start to build experimentation and things into it. Also, strategizer have done a lot of good things, things like the value proposition canvas, ways for you in order to do design thinking. This is a whole field of thought, very much aligned with what we do. All right, let's quickly look at some role methods. In order to make sense of this, um, people have got role-based certifications. So we've got Agile certifications, but actually, how do we do things better? Um, so the PMI and PRINCE2 have, uh, have uh, project management um, processes. So you know, the, the key uh, project management tools we use all now recognize agility. Um, in business analysis, the IOBA um, now have agile analysis and are actually now moving into things like product ownership and cybersecurity. ISTQB have their uh, agile testers, so they recognize it. And of course, you have organizations like IC Agile that uh, then spread out into uh, different things like coaching and testing and, uh, and DevOps and other role-based uh, things as well. Management, there is a whole pile of uh, alignments in management. One of the closest probably to the Agile world is Jürgen Apello's Management 3.0. Well worth a look at the website if you haven't, a lot of techniques and workshops and things you can do um, in order to think about uh, how do we change management, move it from uh, old styles to new styles. And you can see there's a bunch of principles. Agile coaching has been uh, and facilitation of things that uh, 
have evolved over the last few years. There's a whole pile of models here uh, for coaches. There's an agile coaching competency framework from 2011 from Lisa Adkins and Michael Spade. Um, more recently, the Scrum Alliance has come out with an agile coaching growth wheel. Uh, things like liberating structures or ways of doing facilitation to make sure that we're truly inclusive in the way we do it. And also in things like uh, uh, for development teams, uh, the Salmon Method uh, came out last year from Emily Bash. Uh, all of these things around coaching facilitation. We could do a whole talk of 40 methods just on the things in here, but these might be some to go look at. Let's uh, sort of wrap by looking at some organization and transformational methods um, in organi large organizations and governments. You know, the work of Frederick Lelou in reinventing organizations, moving from these yellow and red organizations towards green and teal. Uh, looking at um, uh, governments like the, the UK government, the digital service standard, and also some work that we've been doing here in Australia around the government agility model. Um, so, you know, we're starting to see a lot more uptake in large organizations and government. Uh, agenda shift is a, an interesting one to go look at. Um, you know, it is a whole uh, you know, process uh, for transformation um, and it's framework agnostic. Um, so it gives you a whole bunch of patterns in order to do a successful uh, transformation. Another one of these is open space technology and open space agility. Um, open space technology is just a facilitation framework that Harris and Owen popularized back in 1984 and is used a lot through the agile community. Open space technology is Daniel Mezik's look at essentially, as he says on that diagram there, 100 days to enterprise agility. So how can you, uh, again, move through transformation? It's a brand new type of thing. Uh, you know, align with the manifesto. It's an interesting approach. Um, uh, you know, could you do this in 100 days? But well worth a look if you're on an agile transformation. Uh, looking at things like holacracy and sociocracy are important. Um, this was work of Brian Robertson in 2006. Um, look, there's been... Uh, some limited uptake around this and some, you know, criticism of it. Zappos was the poster child for this and, um, you know, has had limited success, I guess. But it's an interesting way of uh, flattening the cycle. And, uh, you know, there are lots of organizations, that, you know, particularly sort of medium-sized organizations that have success at sociocracy. Uh, again, it's interesting to go look at and learn some of the things that you might be able to use in your own organization. We're all doing things remote these days. Um, so in uh, the last couple of years, the remote agility framework has come out in 2020. Um, and, uh, you know, whilst uh, you really in order to get into this, you need to actually have certification or community access. Um, it's an interesting look at how we do things remote first. Uh, so, um, you know, how you can take things that we used to do in the real world and, uh, and bring them out. And lastly, number 40, Kinefin, making sense of our world. Um, you know, this is constantly updated. If you haven't seen the new model, it was updated um, in, uh, I think it was 2020, um, it's with some different names on it. But essentially, how can we make sense of the world that we're in? And that's uh, extremely important when we're starting to make uh, some sense of our agile world. All right, that was 40. In fact, it was about 60, but there you go. We went very fast. Here's some final thoughts. There is a whole pile of stuff that I would have loved to have put in here that I couldn't, right? This would have been 200 Agile methods and 200 methods, uh, 200 minutes. So, you know, I can just talk about things like NVC and domain-driven development and Lean UX and Spiral Dynamics and a whole pile of other models that are on the cutting room floor. Um, you know, this was just a start, but hopefully this will give you some things to go think about. And the thought I want to leave you with today, tonight, today is the Oath of Non-Allegiance. This is something from 2010 by Alistair Coburn. Unfortunately, the site's no longer up, but he said uh, back in 2010 that we should promise not to exclude from consideration any idea based on its source, but to consider ideas across heritages in order to find the ones that best suit the current situation. In other words, just because your organization or you have done training in one particular school of thought, be open, open to the ones that have started this all off, be open to the brand new ones, and bring those into your world and we'll have a better agile world as a result of it. Thanks for coming on the ride, folks. Uh, uh, happy to certainly uh, hang out uh, with you after the talk if you'd like to talk some more about these. Um, there's my details there if you want more, uh, want more and we'll make the slides available to you. Thank you, Craig. And uh, just a quick reminder, please rate the session in the live stream page when you leave this session and Craig will be in Hangout to answer your questions if you have any questions. Um, so, Craig, we have one question in Q&A, so hopefully from Gerald, if you can answer or you can take it in Hangout. Still have one more minute before we end up this yeah. session. Um, so, uh, I think uh, he posed that question before I talked about things like the remote agility framework. Um, 
So everybody's been impacted by remote working. Um, and what we're starting to see with some of these more, uh, with these newer methods is that that is taken more into consideration. We used to talk about, you know, having teams co-located and, and bringing them together. Uh, that language is, uh, is changing. Uh, but I think we've still got a long way to go, honestly, in relation to remote working. Thank you, Gerald. Thank you, Craig.